Our speaker today, Professor Dan Hooper, is a senior scientist and the head of the theoretical astrophysics group at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Fermilab. He's also associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. Dr. Hooper's research focuses on the interface between particle physics and cosmology, covering topics such as dark matter, dark energy, supersymmetry, neutrinos, extra dimensions, and ultra-high energy cosmic rays. In addition to authoring more than 200 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals and giving numerous talks at scientific conferences and other gatherings, Dr. Hooper is also an active science communicator to the lay public. His two previous books for non-scientists are Dark Cosmos and Nature's Blueprint. He has also written for popular magazines such as Astronomy, Sky and Telescope, and New Scientist, and has given many public lectures. Today's topic is Dan's newest book, which will be available for sale during coffee, At the Edge of Time, Our Universe's First Seconds. Welcome, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here today. I, I, I don't know a lot about ethical humanism, but I like everything I've heard. And uh, you basically had me at board games. Um, so throughout human history, people of all times and all cultures have looked up at their night sky and wondered about their universe and how it came to be. In this respect, Human beings today are just like their ancient ancestors. I don't know anybody who hasn't had that experience of taking in their universe, the night sky or elsewhere, and wondering in this way. But in one important way, we're very different than our ancient ancestors. We're different because we're privileged to live at a very specific time in history where for the first time, when we look up at the night sky, we more or less understand what it is we're looking at. Take this, for example. All right, this is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's part of a program called the Hubble Deep Field. And those blotches of light you see, at least most of them, are individual galaxies, similar more or less in size and shape to our own Milky Way. But because it takes light time to travel through space, this image does not reflect what these galaxies are like in our universe today but what they were like almost 13.8 billion years ago, only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. This is our very young universe indeed. And we can honestly say now that we understand how and why our universe has evolved from the state it was in at that time, a much hotter and more compact state, into the universe we see around us today. We understand those laws of physics. We understand what galaxies are, what they're made of, how they came to be the way they are, and how they, the galaxies we're looking at here evolved and changed into the kinds of structures and things we find in our universe today. It's a very privileged time we are, are able to occupy. As recently as 100 years ago, science didn't have anything to say about, the, about, the, about cosmology, about the universe and how it might change or evolve. In fact, we didn't even have any of the conceptual tools it would take to ask questions about how space might change. As far as physicists were concerned a little over 100 years ago, space was an unchanging fixed backdrop through which objects might move. But space itself couldn't begin or expand or contract or warp or do any of the verby things that we now think space can do. All that changed, though, with Albert Einstein in 1915 with the completion of the general theory of relativity. Einstein showed us that space was not this unchanging background. It could actively do things. It could warp. It could curve. It could expand, and it could contract. In fact, if you apply the equations of Einstein's theory to the space that makes up our universe as a whole, you found you could show that the one thing space could not do is stay the same. It has to expand or contract with time. There's no other way 
around the, what Einstein had taught us. So you've probably heard before that space is expanding, but if you're like most people, you don't really have your head wrapped around what that means. Um, a lot of physicists that's true for as well. It's, it's, it's a very counterintuitive and very strange thing. Well, what we actually observe with our telescopes, specifically what Edwin Hubble observed in 1929 for the first time, is that all the galaxies we can observe are all moving away from us. The distance between us and those galaxies is growing as time goes on. And the farther a given galaxy is away from us, the faster it's receding away. This isn't because the galaxies are moving through space, but rather because the space those galaxies are embedded in is getting larger as time goes on. It's usually around this time in these talks where somebody asks me a, a, a very specific question. I've given enough talks like this to know that probably a third of you or more are asking this exact question right now. You're asking, what is space expanding into? Raise your hand if you were thinking that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even more than a third. Okay. Like I said, I've done this a few times. It sounds like a perfectly reasonable question. But it turns out not to have a very good answer. It doesn't have a good answer because if there were something that space was expanding into, what would, what would we call that something? We'd call it space. All right. So when I or any other cosmologist says space is expanding, we're not describing a process by which things are moving from one piece of space into some unoccupied piece of space or something like that. That's not what we mean. We mean the entirety of space is getting bigger. Any two points in space are getting farther apart from each other as time goes without the space moving into anything else. So for a long time, I was very confused by this. I was a graduate student. And I was like, well, you know, I just can't picture this thing growing without it growing into something. And I found a way to kind of trick myself into understanding it. Because we don't have any intuition for it. Like, you know, we, have to, we have to use our mental architecture and train it and trick it into thinking about the things we wanted to think about. So I came up with the following way, way of, of visualizing it. So here we are in a room. Let's say I want to determine how big the room is. I take a meter stick. I lay it down side by side, and I find out that this room is 30 meters long. Okay? I wait a little while. I do it again. Same meter stick. Now it's 31 meter sticks wide. I can conclude that the room is getting bigger. It's expanding. Or I can think about it as the meter stick shrinking. You can't tell the two apart. Well, that's not really true. I can tell it apart because I can compare the meter stick to any number of other objects. But let's say all the stuff in the room is shrinking together. Then it will look like the room is getting bigger. So if you're confused by space expanding without it expanding into anything, you can instead think about everything in space as shrinking together in unison. Now, that's probably not what's, not, that's probably not what's actually going on. But if you're confused about how space could grow without growing into something, you can just think of everything in it as shrinking instead. OK. So from the realization that our universe is expanding, we can begin to say things about the past, distant past of our universe. Since space is expanding, that means in the past it was denser. All the matter that occupies our space today occupied a smaller amount of space in the past and therefore was higher density and higher temperature. You can run these all the way back. And with our current measurements of the expansion rate of the universe and everything, we can work out that 13.8 billion years ago, our universe was in an extremely hot and dense state. And over that time, it has expanded, become less dense and cooled. That's what we mean by the Big Bang Theory. Probably the single most common misconception about the Big Bang is that it was some sort of cosmic explosion, something that took place somewhere in space. That's not what we mean. When we talk about the Big Bang, we're talking about a state that the entire universe, every little cubic centimeter of space anywhere, was in 13.8 billion years ago. It wasn't an explosion that expanded into other space. Okay, The entirety of space all of the space that makes up our universe today was compact, hot, 
indents. That's what we mean. Okay, so let's take a tour through cosmic history. I have a timeline here showing some of the key events that have taken place over the 13.8 billion years of our universe's history. All right, we start on the left there, right after the Big Bang, a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, the first stars began to form. We called this cosmic dawn. These stars were pretty different from the stars we find in our universe today. They're a lot bigger, and they were short-lived, and they were very hot. They kind of uh, burned fast and died young sort of thing. Um, you know, another uh, nine billion years after that, uh, our sun formed along with the planets that make up our solar system. And then four and a half billion years after that, uh, we find ourselves in the little speck of cosmic time where modern life and human history played out. It would, human history would take up less than one pixel rendered on this sort of slide. So this is a timeline that's not wrong. It's a perfectly reasonable way to depict the history of our universe. But cosmologists, for the most part, would think this is a really boring way to do it. This is boring because all the most interesting stuff happened under that yellow dot that I just labeled as the Big Bang. It's a lot more interesting if I show it on a logarithmic scale like this. So instead of just having one billion years between tick marks, now I have factors of 10 or 100 between tick marks allowing me to go back farther and closer to the Big Bang, where, according to cosmologists like myself, all the most interesting stuff happened. All right, so now in this timeline, I can go back farther. I can see, a, um, I, can, I also put the temperature of the universe at some of these uh, points in time. Today, our universe is just a little under three degrees above absolute zero. What I mean by that is I go out in the, some distant, unoccupied piece of space, and I, I stop the universe from changing. I just kind of freeze it in place. And I put an object in that space. And I waited forever. What temperature would it eventually reach equilibrium at? And the answer is about 2.7 degrees. That's, that's the kind of the, the background stuff in, in space now. But if you go back to cosmic dawn, when the first stars were forming, it was a lot hotter. It was about 50 degrees. That's still pretty cold. Okay? I mean, it's, that's, that would that'd be very, very cold for any of us. But 50 degrees above absolute zero is a lot hotter than it is today. And then you go back farther to a point about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and you find that the universe was then at a pretty toasty temperature of 3,000 degrees. This is like the temperature of a red star, okay? the surface of a red star. And again, I don't mean that some place in the universe was 3,000 degrees. I mean all of the universe. Every tiny volume of the universe, any place in the universe was 3,000 degrees. And this isn't just any old temperature. This is a very important temperature as far as cosmologists are concerned because this is the temperature at which atoms melt. Now, most physicists don't go around saying atoms melt it's my choice of language, so some people might nitpick. But what I mean by that is if I take some atoms and I dump them in a thermal bath of 3,000 degrees, their electrons break off. Okay? So, this, so prior to this point in cosmic history, prior to the first few hundred thousand years, the universe was full of things like electrons and protons and other nuclei, but there were no complete electrically neutral atoms. They just couldn't persist in that environment. And that means that prior to this transition, space was opaque. Light could not pass through it. A plasma of charged particles, light simply can't move through. They just bounce off all those particles over and over again. Light trying to get through the early universe was about as difficult as light trying to shine straight through the Earth. It just won't go anywhere at all. But then suddenly, this 380,000-year point, electrically neutral atoms started to form, and light got liberated. Went in all directions throughout space, traveling in straight lines, and it turns out that light is still in our universe today. We're all bathed in it right now. That is a picture of the very light I'm talking about. This is called the cosmic microwave background. This is not an artist's depiction or a theorist's uh, speculation. This is an image taken by the Planck telescope of the light that was released into our universe 380,000 years or so after the Big Bang. 
We call this cosmic microwave background. If you have an old-fashioned television with like rabbit ear antennas, you turn it to channel one where there's no broadcasting, about 1% of the static you get will be this light. This is the most important data cosmologists have. Those little hot and cold spots, the red and blue points, tell us how the energy and matter was distributed in space at that important moment 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is a detailed map of our universe very shortly after the Big Bang. It tells us how the dark matter was distributed, how the atoms were distributed. It tells us how much of those things and other things there were in our universe. It tells us about particles called neutrinos. It's a treasure trove. And over the last 50 years, we've gone from discovering it for the first time to measuring it, measuring it better, measuring it better, measuring it better. And now, I mean, this, this is just, this is a Picasso to me, okay? I look at this and I just, I'm just overawed by how much information, how much this tells us about our universe in its earliest eras, or at least an early era. It's not the earliest. Speaking of earlier eras, let's take this even farther back. So I can go to this, instead of talking about hundreds of thousands of years after the Big Bang, let's go to the first minutes and seconds after the Big Bang. At this point, the temperature of all space was, you know, around a billion degrees. Okay? A billion degrees is like the temperature of the core of a very massive star, a star bigger than the sun. Even the core of the sun isn't that hot. And at a billion degrees, nuclear fusion can take place very efficiently. So you can think of the, our universe in its first seconds and minutes as a giant nuclear fusion reactor. Fusion was going on everywhere throughout space. The process is like this very commonplace. So we have a couple of protons and neutrons free out in space. They fuse together to make deuterium and then tritium and helium. Um, this was going on everywhere throughout space. All the neutrons in space basically got locked up in the helium in this process. And we can calculate from the equations that we, uh, we think we know about the laws of physics how much of this stuff should have formed, how much deuterium, how much helium, and other stuff like lithium and beryllium. And then we can go out in the universe and see if that's the right amount, if that's actually the amount that exists, and lo and behold, it is. So that gives me a lot of confidence, or my colleagues and I, a lot of confidence, that we basically understand our universe's history from a few seconds after the Big Bang up to the present. If we had something substantively wrong, that calculation wouldn't have got given us the right answer. So I would say a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, we're absolutely certain we understand what the universe was like and how it transitioned to what we have. To the first few seconds, we're pretty confident, although we could have some parts of the story we're still missing. And then before that, we know almost nothing. If we go back even earlier, we can, we can take our equations and just run them backwards and hope we're getting the right answer. For example, we think that about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, the first protons and neutrons formed. This was when the universe would have been 10 trillion, uh, yeah, 10 trillion degrees or so. Prior to that, instead of protons and neutrons, you had particles called quarks and gluons, but they all became bound together into protons and neutrons around this time. But like I said, we don't have any way of actually observing that. That's just if we take the equations and run them backwards and hope they apply to our universe in that state. The way we try to inform ourselves the best we can about this first fraction of a second is not by observing the universe in that state. We don't have any means to do that yet. But instead, we use machines called particle accelerators to try to recreate the conditions that our universe was in in that first fraction of a second. This is a picture of the world's most partic powerful particle accelerator. It's called the Large Hadron Collider. You may have heard of it. It's in Geneva, Switzerland, and, uh, and also goes across the border into France. That main ring is a 17-mile underground tunnel. And through that tunnel, powerful magnets accelerate and propel protons at nearly the speed of light. When I say nearly the speed of light, what I mean is 99.999997% of the speed of light. 
These beams of protons are then collided into one another in these elaborate detector modules called uh, ATLAS and CMS. These are gymnasium-sized uh, machines full of 21st century electronics. And when these protons collide inside of these detectors, a huge spray of particles is produced, and these machines try to measure as much of that as they can, <coughs> reconstructing how that collision took place in detail. The reason we do this is by colliding protons at the highest possible speeds, we're trying to put as much energy into one place at one time as we possibly can. And then through Einstein's equation equals mc squared, we convert that energy into large particles with a large amount of mass. We produce things like top quarks, which was discovered where I work at the Fermi National Accelerator back in, uh, in the 90s, mid-90s. Um, in 2012, the Large Hadron Collider discovered a particle called the Higgs boson for the first time. It had been theorized for 50 years, but we didn't know it existed until the Large Hadron Collider produced and observed it. Um, there are other things called W bosons and Z bosons and bottom quarks and strange quarks and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of which are exceedingly rare in our universe today. There's not just a bunch of top quarks out there in the universe. Um, you can only uh, study them in environments like this. But in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang, all of these particles were commonplace. All of space was full of them. The collisions were going on constantly between particles at that stage. And those collisions would produce a top quark, which would be immediately destroyed and converted into a Higgs boson, and then a Z boson, a W boson, and some electrons. Constant flux of all of these forms of matter and energy going into and out of existence. That was the state of our universe in its first fraction of a second. And the Large Hadron Collider allows us to understand in some precise detail what the laws of physics were around a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. This is a list of all of the known forms of matter and energy that we currently understand based on particle accelerators. Um, you see the Higgs boson, the quarks, the things we call leptons, and then things like the W and Z bosons, photons, and gluons. All of these were commonplace in our universe a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And thanks to the Large Hadron Collider and other machines like it, we more or less now understand the laws of physics these objects follow. We understand how they would have been produced and interacted with each other in this very, very early primordial state. All right, so at this point in the talk, you may be under the impression that we understand this first trillionth of a second or so quite well. That is not the case. We know a lot about the laws of physics that we think applied in that state, but we don't have any way of observing our universe in this early state. And although the Large Hadron Collider can teach us a lot, there are th questions it cannot answer. There may have been forms of matter and energy at this early state that the Large Hadron Collider is not effective at producing and therefore observing. There may have been events or transitions that took place in this first trillionth of a second that we just don't have any way of learning about a Large Hadron Collider. Maybe a more powerful accelerator might teach us, one, teach us something like that one day, or maybe an accelerator that would collide more protons. That would be a, a useful thing. And it's not like the Large Hadron Collider is not colliding a lot of protons. It's, per, it's colliding hundreds of millions of protons every second, but that's far, far fewer than were taking place in the early universe. So something that might seem exceedingly rare was actually super commonplace in the first trillionth of a second. Furthermore, there are several lines of argument that, at least in my opinion, point to some pretty big misunderstandings, or at least incomplete understandings, that we currently have about the early universe. In my book, I talk about four different lines or puzzles that cosmologists have been struggling with for years and decades, all of which seem to suggest that the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang may have played out very differently than our textbooks currently describe. So let me talk about those four puzzles one after the other. The first is the puzzle of why matter exists. You might not think this is a big puzzle, but it turns out to be really hard to explain. 
When we run machines like the Large Hadron Collider and study the laws of physics, we find that for every form of matter, there exists a nearly identical version of it that we call antimatter. Identical except for the fact that all of their, what we call the quantum properties of that matter, flipped, reverse. So like the electron has its antimatter counterpart called a positron. Positron is just like an electron, it's the same mass, behaves in the same way, except instead of having negative electric charge, it is positive electric charge. And it turns out, based on all of our measurements and experiments, that you can only create matter if you create it alongside with an, of an equal amount of antimatter, and you can only destroy matter if you destroy along with it an equal amount of antimatter. The fates of these two substances seem closely intertwined. So for example, I can take a couple of photons of light and collide them together and make an electron and a positron. And I can take an electron and a positron and I can put them together and destroy them both. But I can't make an electron without making some antimatter. And I can't destroy an electron without destroying some antimatter. The stuff comes in together in these pairs. So what does this have to do with the early universe? Well, in the early universe, there should have been an early, very early state in which the universe was filled with equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And as the universe expanded and cooled, that matter and antimatter should have obliterated each other, leaving our universe without anything like electrons or protons or neutrons and therefore no atoms. So everything we think we know about the laws of physics says you and I should not exist, nor should stars, nor should planets, all that stuff should have been wiped out. But it didn't happen. That tells us that we don't know what it was, but something we don't know about happened in that first fraction of a second. Something that was volatile, something that broke the laws of physics as we currently understand them in very specific antimatter, matter, un, uh, asymmetric ways. We don't know what it is, but we know it took place, and we have a lot of guesses, but currently no way of really uh, narrowing down that list of guesses towards the right answer. All right, the second puzzle of the four that I think points to an uh, incomplete understanding of the Big Bang is the question of dark matter. This is an image of our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. It's a few hundred million, I'm sorry, if, let me make sure I got this right. A few, uh, yeah, a few million light years away. A few million light years away. Um, you can look at an object like Andromeda and look at how fast the stars on its outskirts are moving around and use that information to deduce the mass contained in Andromeda. Here's an example. So here's the rotational velocity of stars. Um, as a function of how far those stars are from the galactic center. If I look at the, the visible parts of Andromeda, like the stars and gas and dust, I would expect to measure something like the curve we've drawn here. But when we actually measure it, we get something more like the curve I've drawn on top. We currently understand the explanation of this puzzle to be that most of the mass in Andromeda is not made of things like stars and gas and dust but of something else, something that doesn't appreciably absorb, reflect, or uh, radiate light. We don't know what this stuff is, but for a lack of a better name, we call it dark matter. But I promise you, just because you can name something does not mean you understand it. We currently think that the dark matter is some sort of gas of subatomic particle that doesn't interact with other forms of matter in an appreciable way, except through the force of gravity. One reason we think that is that if we take a computer simulation, like I've shown here, and you start the universe in a pretty uniform pattern, like we know it was in based on the cosmic microwave background that I showed you before, that image, and then you just let the universe expand and let gravity act on that dark matter, is something we know how to calculate, it will evolve in these steps as shown here until you get something like the lower right picture there. It turns out that that lower right picture looks just like the large scale structure 
of the universe we live in. In other words, because most of the matter in our universe is made of dark matter, we can explain the patterns of galaxies and galaxy clusters that we observe in our universe today. If dark matter didn't exist, we would not be able to explain that pattern of structure. Throughout cosmic history, the dark matter has played the role of the scaffolding of our universe. Before there were galaxies, dark matter collapsed into these things we call halos. And then the gravity of those halos dragged in the atoms that would make up the galaxies that we observe. If it weren't for the dark matter, that would never would have happened. We would have had far less structure in our universe today. We had a pretty good idea, we thought, 10 or 15 years ago about what dark matter was likely to be made of. We have these particles in mind called WIMPs. It's not a very specific kind of particle, but more of a class of particles. And we imagined that these particles would have been produced in large numbers after the Big Bang. Most of them would have destroyed each other, kind of like, Matt, like uh, I said before, ordinary atoms should have. But a small amount would have survived, and that would make up the dark matter today. And based on those sorts of estimates, or those sorts of calculations, we worked out how much these particles should interact with ordinary forms of matter and what kind of experiments we would have to conduct to finally observe those particles. I show you this picture because this is a deep underground laboratory that um, has several experiments that are actively looking for these sorts of dark matter particles. This is a laboratory in Italy, but you can find examples of underground physics laboratories all over the world. But some of these experiments, like the xenon experiment, the dark side experiment, the DOM experiment, the crest experiment, all of these are experiments actively looking for these WIMP dark matter particles. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would say that there was an extremely good chance that over the next 10 years, these experiments would succeed, they would detect the individual particles that make up dark matter, and we'd just be uh, spending the next years or decades increasingly precisely measuring the dark matter's characteristics. That was what the program we set out to do. And the experiments worked beautifully. They're super, super sensitive. Um, they've exceeded all reasonable expectations for their performance, and yet they have not seen a single particle of dark matter. Our ideas about what dark matter were just can't be the right ideas. We don't know what the right ideas are. But remi I'll remind you that those ideas were based on how we thought this stuff should have been produced in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang. The fact that we haven't been able to see the particles interact in the way that these sort of arguments suggested they should might be telling us we're thinking about the wrong kind of particles, but it also might be telling us that the Big Bang didn't play out, that first fraction of a second didn't play out the way we naively had expected. The third of the four puzzles is a puzzle about something we call dark energy. And it has to do with how the universe has been expanding over the last few billion years. So if you take Einstein's equations, you can work out the possibilities, and there's a range of possibilities for how our universe might expand over time. And here are three examples. All of them have our universe expanding today. But depending on how much matter there is in the universe, maybe it will expand forever, getting bigger without limit. Maybe it will expand, but eventually kind of plateau to a maximum size. Or maybe it will expand for a while, reach a maximum size, and then begin to contract. All of these were possibilities according to the equations of general relativity. And then in the late 90s, we finally had the telescopes it took to find out which of these, kind, you know, which kind of these universes we actually lived in. We started to measure things well enough to, to deduce that. And what did we find? Something more like that. Okay? So none of the above was the answer. In a universe that was filled basically with matter, that doesn't make any sense. What instead we have been forced to conclude by this observation is that space must be filled with a different kind of energy that's causing it to expand at a different, an accelerating rate relative to what Einstein led us to predict or expect. We call this stuff dark energy. And unlike matter and other sorts of conventional energy, as space expands, dark energy doesn't dilute. So if I take a cubic meter, and I have a certain amount of dark energy in it. And then that cubic meter expands, so now it's two cubic meters. 
I've doubled the amount of dark energy in that volume, while I've diluted the amount of dark matter or atoms or other more conventional kinds of energy. That means as cosmic history plays out, dark energy plays an increasingly important role, making up a bigger and bigger fraction of the energy density in our universe today. And today, over 70% of the energy density in our universe is in dark energy. Another 25% is in dark matter. And around 4% is in the form of atoms. So this is kind of a picture of how we are currently picturing the expansion evolution history of our universe. We start out very small and expanded in a kind of slow, steady way over the first several billion years. And then a few billion years ago, things started to expand kind of out of control at an exponential rate growing faster and faster and faster. There's no reason to think this is going to turn around or stop anytime soon. We can't be sure, but our understanding of the picture right now is that our universe is going to expand without limit, becoming colder and less dense as time goes on. Which brings us to the very last of the four puzzles. And you can see it in this little point here on this plot. When we look at the large scale structure of our universe, we're surprised by two very puzzling things. One, it's really uniform. If I point a telescope over in that direction and then in that direction and then in that direction, and I look back as far as I possibly can, they look all the same. Okay? I mean, I'm not saying they're exactly the same stars and galaxies and planets or something, but if I, you couldn't, they're all roughly the same temperature, they have roughly the same density, all the basic broad stroke patterns are the same everywhere you look. And that doesn't make any sense because that part of space was never anywhere near or in contact with that part or that part. It's like finding a whole bunch of stopwatches in a forest somewhere and finding that they're all synchronized to a fraction of a millisecond. And, and these aren't, you know, that would tell you that at some point these, these stopwatches were all synchronized. They were brought together and somebody, you know, synced them up. But that part of the universe and that part and that part never had a chance to be synced up. That never should have happened. So we were really confused about that. And another thing we were really confused about has to do with the geometry or shape of our universe. You are probably taught, like in a ninth or tenth grade geometry class, that if I follow parallel lines, they stay parallel. You are probably taught that I take any triangle and I add up the three angles, you get 180 degrees. Well, I hate to be the one to break this to you, <laughs> but your high school geometry teacher might not have known everything about geometry. There is a no. I'm sure they're very honest in everything, but that turns out to be a very special case. That's what we call Euclidean geometry. And Einstein showed us that space need not be Euclidean. In fact, any time you put matter and energy in space, you find that it breaks the laws of Euclidean geometry. You can have spaces where parallel lines converge as you follow them, or diverge as you follow them. And in those sorts of spaces with curvature, if I draw three points and draw straight lines between them and add up the three angles, you'll get more or less than 180 degrees. The specific Euclidean case is, is a very special case. It's not what you would expect. Okay? Our universe's large-scale structure, we had every reason to expect, would either be positively or negatively curved. It would just be a matter of measuring how much. And then we started to measure it. It's flat. It's Euclidean. To, to within a fraction of a percent. It's really, and probably, probably much more flat than that. We've, we've never been able to measure any substantial departure from Euclidean large-scale structure of our universe. And that didn't make any sense. There's no reason for us to expect that. So in 1980, facing these puzzles, a physicist named Alan Guth proposed a, a, a solution to them. He postulated that very, very shortly after the Big Bang, our universe may have grown exceedingly fast. We call this cosmic inflation. And what it entails is a universe that grew over a period of 10 to the minus 32 seconds by a volume factor of 10 to the 75. Suddenly, 
there were a bunch of places in space that were right next to each other. In, in close contact, they could synchronize, torn apart by vast, vast distances, explaining why when I look there, there, and there, they look like their neighbors. Because once they were. It also functions in the same way if you blow up a balloon suddenly, its surface looks flatter. Okay? If I take a, a small balloon, it looks really curved. But now a big balloon looks really flat. So you tend to make a universe transform from a curved universe into a Euclidean one by inflating it. So we don't know that this happened for sure, but I would say there's enough evidence now that's accumulated over the last years and decades that most cosmologists think inflation or something very much like it almost, uh, you know, almost certainly took place, probably took place. But we're not sure. Um, one thing I'm particularly excited about regarding inflation is if it really did take place, it probably is still going on somewhere. Because once a piece of space starts inflating, it doesn't tend to stop. What I mean by that is I take a piece of space and it grows dramatically and a piece here stops inflating and a piece here starts to stop inflating and a piece here stops inflating and those places go on to form things like our universe. But all those other places that didn't immediately stop inflating, they get dramatically bigger and a few places within them then stop inflating and this goes on forever and you never run out of space because it's just growing so fast. So inflation seems to predict that there's not just a universe, but a vast multiverse of possibilities that's constantly being created without limit. This might even be connected to the puzzle of dark energy. We're very confused, not that dark energy exists, but by the quantity that we find dark energy to exist in our universe. But if there's a multiverse of possibilities, then there would be different amounts of dark energy in all of those universes. And it turns out that our universe contains approximately the maximum amount of dark energy that's consistent with the, evolu or with, the, uh, with the emergence of life. So maybe most of these universes have way more dark energy in them than ours, and we're just the one on the kind of the boundary where life could emerge. After all, if there was a lot more dark energy, it would have kicked in earlier, and our universe would have expanded without limit long before there was any chance to form stars or planets or galaxies. So we're in a very special corner of the multiverse according to that picture. So let me kind of bring this all together and then we're going to do a little uh, question and answer uh, thing in a bit. But Let me kind of skip ahead to that. I, I'm fond of saying it's an exciting time to be a cosmologist. I say it more often than I should probably. People get annoyed by it. But let me tell you why I think that's true. For the last years, and frankly decades, physicists have thought they would be able to solve the puzzles I'm talking about here. They, including myself, thought there were really good arguments for why we would easily be able to, not easily, but we would, in a straightforward way, be able to detect the particles that make up dark matter and start to measure their characteristics. And we did those things and it didn't work. The particles probably exist, but they don't take the form that our assessment of the early universe led us to expect. They're just not there. We thought we could measure the expansion history of the universe and figure out which of Einstein's possibilities ours corresponds to, and the answer is none of the above. This dark energy stuff exists. We don't really have a good way of explaining why it exists in the way that it does, unless we appeal to a multiverse, which a lot of my colleagues aren't comfortable with. I am. Um, there's the question of matter and antimatter. Why haven't they wiped each other out in the first fraction of a second? And that guarantees that some weird stuff went down then. <laughs> stuff we don't currently know about or understand. So I look at these things and I see signs of a coming revolution in cosmology. A total rewrite, a, re a dramatic rethink of the first fraction of a second. I don't know what this rewrite's going to look like, but it feels to me like physicists felt like in 1904. You have this beautiful Newtonian theory. It's explained so much over 200 years, and it just keeps solving problem after problem. But in 1904, you couldn't explain why the speed of light was uniform, or why the planet Mercury's orbit was screwed up, or 
why atoms give off light in a certain way, or where the sun gets its energy from. These were the loose ends of physics in 1904, the, the things, the remaining lag, and nagging questions that physics hadn't been able to solve, Newtonian physics. And then in 1905, Einstein came along, introducing his theory of relativity and the first papers on what we now call quantum physics. Answered all those questions and more, not by simply building on the old paradigm, but by offering a totally new way to think about matter, energy, space, and time. No one in 1904 could have told you what that revolution was going to look like, but all the signs were there that it was coming. I can't tell you what the coming revolution in cosmology is going to look like. I can't even tell you really that there will be one. But that's what it looks like to me. And I, I for one, am excited to see it play out. Thanks for your attention. This has been a lot of fun. Hi. Hi. Um, I recently read that the Planck satellite generated some data that instead of showing a flat universe or like a negative saddle-shaped universe, there was some indication it was had a slightly positive. Mm -hmm. And I just was curious, do you think that's an outlier? But if it's not, what implications is that going to have? And as far as inflation and um, just the whole... Yeah, structure so of the beginning of the universe. One of the authors of that paper is a friend of mine, and um, so I'm, yeah, there's a, a message, something my mom taught me when I was growing up about not saying bad things, blah, blah, blah. But uh, um, if that turns out to be right, I'll give you my car. All right? Hi. Hi. I, now. Um, I was wondering about uh, asymmetry in regards to uh, quarks. Uh, how did asymmetry work in the pre-baryonic uh, era of the universe? Or was there asymmetry when there were just quarks? And how did, it, how did quarks start to affect asymmetry once baryons did, did start to uh, coalesce? So what we really know is that by the time the nuclei were forming, Okay, uh, there was the asymmetry was in place. The asymmetry, by which I mean, there was more matter than antimatter. And some point before that, it set in, but we don't know when. Um, it could have been that when the universe was a trillionth of a second old, uh, there were more quarks than antiquarks. Okay, so then as things expanded and cooled, the quarks and antiquarks that encountered each other were destroyed, and eventually the antiquarks ran out leaving only a very small amount of quarks left to go on and make the matter we, ex we were made up of. Um, but it could have happened that was even later. You know, we, do we don't know. Uh, but the, the net amount of matter over antimatter in some primordial time must have been off by one part in about 10 billion. That's the sort of number you need to explain uh, the, su the, the, the supremacy of matter over antimatter ultimately. Hi, um, I was wondering if the properties of dark matter and dark energy could have anything to do with the asymmetry uh, between matter and antimatter. So there have been a lot of good papers written, I think I've written one or two, not that they were good, but about the subject. Um, and, and certainly dark matter could be connected with it. So it's possible that the reason our universe seems to contain more matter than antimatter is that the dark matter is mostly made up of antimatter, okay? So they balance each other in some sort of way. Um, we don't have any evidence that's true, um, but I write a lot of papers on things we don't have evidence for. So, and, and, and that's the sort of thing we, we speculate about and, and ideally devise ways that we could test that hypothesis. Right here. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts about this postulation of the fifth Force the K seventeen. What was the last part? What was seventeen? Well, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think there's any uh, validity to it? This uh, 
experiments done by the Hungarians. Oh, oh, the uh, weird beryllium thing, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm super, so we, we know of four forces, okay? Gravity, the electromagnetic force, and what we call the strong nuclear force that holds nuclei together, and the weak nuclear force that causes certain kinds of radioactive decay to take place. It would really surprise me if those are the only four forces. Okay, there are almost certainly going to be other forces that we discover over time. After all, a hundred years ago, we only we only knew about two of those. Um, it would surprise me if a hundred years passed without us learning about more. That being said, I think the particular experiment and its cousins that you're referring to have not presented a compelling case yet. Um, so I they're, they're, they've observed um, some anomalous decay, some decays we can't explain that could be suggestive of a new force that's very feebly interacting with certain kinds of exotic forms of matter. Um, I would probably, I would bet against that, but not in a way that I would be, not as dismissive as I was about the curved universe thing. Um, but I think the odds are small that that would turn out to, to hold up to scrutiny, would be my, my guess. I still don't fully understand Schrodinger's cat. Oh, me Does it have anything to do with cosmology? Yeah, in a sense it has to do with everything. All right, so I like this topic, so I'm going to take a little opportunity to tell you all about Schrodinger's cat. The equations that dictate the subatomic universe, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, say that if you take an electron or something, it's not in one place at one time. It's in what we call a superposition of places. Um, it doesn't have one velocity. It has a superposition of different velocities. And if it does something, if an event takes place involving that electron, it doesn't happen at one time. It happens over a superposition of times. All of these are kind of built into something we call the electron's wave function. So in the mid-30s, uh, Erwin Schrödinger proposed what he called a thought experiment, you know, what's known as a thought experiment. This is not an experiment you'd actually go out and conduct. It's a way to visualize or, or explore the consequences of something, like the equations of quantum mechanics. He, he described the hype following hypothetical thought experiment. He said, I take a radioactive atom, okay, and it has a half-life of an hour. So if I wait an hour, there's a 50% chance that it will decay, and a 50% chance it won't. Now, I put up a, like a Geiger counter right next to it. Okay, So if it decays, it triggers the Geiger counter. And I hook the Geiger counter up to a bottle of poison so that if the Geiger counter gets triggered, you break the poison. And poison gas is released. Okay? You put all this in a sealed box, and you put a cat in. Lock the door. So... Before quantum mechanics, what you would say is after an hour, the cat might be alive because the thing hasn't decayed yet. And 50% chance that he's dead because it has decayed. But what Schrodinger pointed out, I think correctly, is that quantum mechanics doesn't say that's the right way to think about it. We need a different kind of grammar. The cat isn't alive or dead. The cat's in a superposition of dead and alive state, so the, the cat is alive and dead. The universe is a superposition of the cat being alive and dead at the same time. And then you open the door, and now this is where it gets really you know, contentious. At the time, the physicists of the day, and some still today, would argue the way to think about it is you open the door, and the wave function of the universe collapses, taking on either an alive cat state or a dead cat state. So the active observation, according to traditional quantum mechanics, collapses the wave function from an and configuration to an or configuration, to one or the other. In the same way that if you look at an electron, it might be in a superposition of states, and then you measure it, and you find out where it is, it's only in one state then. But there's another way to think about it, and I actually hold that this is the most reasonable way to think about it. Um, it's called many worlds quantum mechanics. And it says that when I open that box, my consciousness and my active observation doesn't do anything. I'm not any different than the other matter that makes up space in our universe. So I open that box, and 
before the cat was in a superposition of alive and dead state. Now I am in a superposition of being somebody observing a dead cat and somebody observing a live cat. Both are very real. So in this worldview, the whole universe is in a colossal superposition of every quantum possibility playing out in every possible way. That's what I think quantum mechanics tells us. If you want to learn more about that, there's a really good book by Sean Carroll called Something Deeply Hidden. It just came out this year. Can't recommend it enough. Um, but anyway, that's it, it. So because I think Schrodinger's cat, to answer your question, because I think Schrodinger's cat tells us that the whole universe is in a giant quantum superposition of all quantum possibilities, that, of course, has something to do with our universe. Everything that's ever happened in our universe is you know, one of that quantum plethora of things. Um, that being said, I don't really have to use this on a, my research on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't impact any of my, my work, but it definitely impacts my worldview and how I think about the universe I live in. That was a long answer, but it was a good question. Hi, great talk. Thank you. Um, I was thinking while I was listening to you that uh, this dark energy thing, you know, well, it reeks of the ether a little bit. But, you know, there's obviously something causing, you know, we know that gravity, the laws of gravity, we tried to mess with that to see if we could make it work out, right? To see if we could get the rotation of the galaxies correct. And a lot of people decided against that, right? I mean, what is it? Is it 2% maybe that still believe that? Less. Less? Okay. So we're in this hook, line, and sinker. So we have to find a way to explain it even if we're wrong, right? Because that's how science works. We're going to have to explain it. So is it that we're getting closer to another? You know, let's talk about multiverse. Are, we, are, are two universes getting closer uh, together? And if they are, that doesn't make any sense because they're both in a void, and the void doesn't have any dimension, correct? So when I use the word universe, I mean everything that can possibly even hypothetically interact with our space. So by that definition, you can't talk about two universes getting closer or farther apart from one another. They're totally disconnected forever and, and, and irreversibly so. So um, if, if there was something that I could get closer to or I could send the signal to or I could interact with in some way, I would call that being in my universe. Even if I can't see it. You can't observe it. Um, if I can interact with it in any way, no matter how feeble or indirect, so my universe. Yeah. Uh, pardon me. Uh, pardon me. Uh, I, I appreciate that you want to do the dialogue, but you know, let's let's stick to the Q and A. All right. So um, I'm pretty open-minded about solutions to dark energy. Um, a lot of great papers have written about various kinds of theories that would mimic this effect. A lot of papers have been written about dark matter not, being, not, not existing and instead the laws of gravity being different, the laws of dynamics. Those just don't work. I mean, I, I think we're at a dead end when it comes to that, although there were a lot, there were a lot of period of time where it wasn't clear. Um, at this moment in time, I think dark matter is probably a, one or more species of exotic matter that we haven't detected yet. And dark energy is probably a vacuum energy that's built into the, the, the laws of physics in a way we don't understand. Um, but that being said, in 1904, a lot of people were pretty sure that this, this, and this, and they turned out to all be wrong. So I'm, I'm excited to be wrong. That would be great. Uh, hello, sir. Um, in your presentation, I, I believe I heard you say something with respect to a multiverse, many universes. And I, I'm wondering if you use that you know, I'm, I might have missed something, I probably did, whether that's a reality or you were using it as a useful intellectual abstraction. No, I, I mean, um, here, here's my own personal view on the, on, on the multiverse. You know, If you went back far enough in time, you could find any number of groups of people who lived on an island somewhere. They'd never seen an, any other piece of land. They probably convinced themselves that that island they lived on was the only place. And then, you know, they built a boat or somebody else did and, you know, learned there were a bunch of other islands, maybe even continents. And okay, well, we can accept that, they say. You know, you, you know, fighting tooth and nail to resist it, but they, they probably eventually accepted it. 
And then some time passes and, you know, it's a 1500s or something. And at that time, oh, the overwhelming conventional wisdom is that the Earth was totally unique. Those things you called planets weren't like the Earth. We didn't think of the Earth as a planet. We thought of it as this unique thing that planets went around. And by the way, the sun was a planet back then. And then Galileo and Copernicus and stuff show that's not really true. In fact, Venus has phases just like whatever, and Jupiter has moons, the moon has terrain on it, all these sorts of things that put the Earth as just one of many objects. But even then, even after accepting that, people weren't willing to accept that those other bright things in the sky might just be like the sun but farther away. Okay? That took a long time to convince people. One of my uh, favorite writers from that time is a guy by the name of Giordano Bruno. He was burned at the stake for various heretical beliefs, including advocating that the stars were really just like the sun, but farther away. So that was a very unpopular idea at the time. <laughs> and then as recently as the 1920s, um, astronomers were arguing about whether the Milky Way was the entirety of the universe or not. We saw other things that now we know are galaxies, independent of the Milky Way, but some, of, some people argued, it was a conventional view at the time, that those were just clouds of gas in the near, within the Milky Way. We now know that there are, I don't even know what the current, something like a trillion galaxies in our observable universe. So, we used to ask whether the, our island was the only, only place, then whether the Earth was unique, then whether the Sun was unique, whether Milky Way was unique. I don't think it's would be too surprising if our reluctance to accept the idea that our universe might not be uh, unique is uh, the next ne logical step in that continuum. Hi. Hey. Um, thanks so much for your talk. My um, pleasure. So I would be interested if you could give me a very your elevator pitch um, as the National Science Foundation liaison on the Hill to keep funding Fermi and all your all the other expensive big toys that we need to keep learning this stuff um, to a reluctant junior congressman from Kansas who believes that all of your uncertainty leaves room for intelligent design being the alternative. Mm. I mean, why, why do I want to keep, what do I learn that's helpful here that I should keep as a society investing in? All right, so. I've actually gone to the Hill as a, a advocate for science funding um, in the past. It's been a long time, but I've done a couple of trips. And um, here's the pitch I would make back then about why it makes sense to fund this stuff. And um, I mean, if, if you're asking me why I do science, it's not these reasons. But to this reluctant junior congressman you're describing, I will say that for every dollar you spend on science, economists will tell you you get several dollars back in GDP growth. Part of it is that we intentionally or otherwise produce technology. Okay? Um, the Fermilab doesn't try to make technology. Okay? That's not what we're setting out to do. We're setting out to understand the fundamental laws of physics. But the number of patents we produce is a gargantuan list. And that stuff is really valuable. It drives innovation. And uh, we don't hold those patents, we give them to the, the public and let industry improve our lives with that, those ideas that we, we come up with. But it's not just that. The other thing is that science, especially the kinds of science I'm talking about today, are a really great way to motivate young people to learn a lot of math, a lot of computer science, and a lot of science science, right? And most of those people, including ones who get PhDs in physics and astronomy, don't then go and spend their career doing physics and astronomy. They go into tech, they go into industry, they become engineers, they go into finance, and the amount that those skills that they develop because they were inspired by cosmology or whatever other kind of fundamental science we're talking about, made them study harder, go to more competitive schools, work harder, those skills enable them to do things that were very profitable for our system. And um, so, I, and, and this is not my opinion. This is the mainstream consensus among economists who study the problem. That's my answer to the junior congressman. 
Okay. Um, I like her question better than my question, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> this has been something that's been bothering me for a long time. Um, so general relativity um, explains gravity by being curvature of space-time. That's correct. Why do we have to think of gravity like we think of electromagnetism and the strong and weak force? Why does it need to be mediated by a particle? Why, why the graviton? So, so let me unpack that for people in the room who might not have, have known some of the things you just said. So in the Newtonian view of gravity, gravity is a force that takes objects with mass and attracts them to one another. Okay. Einstein showed that this is really not exactly the case. I mean, you can still think about it and you won't be wrong to think about it that way. But what he showed is that when you put energy, including mass, into space, it changes the geometry of space around that object. And then, because when you put an object in that space and ask, well, how would it move? Not making any reference to any kind of force, it turns out it moves in the way that Newtonian gravity says it should have. So for example, the Earth, according to Newton, is, being, is moving in an ellipse around the sun because the sun is pulling it towards the sun, preventing it from going off in a straight line. Einstein said, well, no, I mean, that's a reasonable approximation, but what's really going on is the sun is so much energy that the geometry of space throughout the solar system is different, and a straight line in that geometry looks like this. Okay? So we're just moving in a straight line, what we call a geodesic through space and time. So when you take a force like electromagnetism and understand it at the subatomic level in a particle physics way, what we actually understand is that charged particles are pulling and pushing against each other because photons, particles of light, are communicating that force. They're going back and forth through space, telling that electron or whatever that there's this charged particle here, pull t come towards me, push away, whatever. So the particle that makes electromagnetism exist is the photon. And the particle that makes a strong nuclear force exist is the gluon. And the particles that make the weak nuclear force exist are the W and Z bosons. We're pretty sure that there exists a quanta of gravity called the graviton. We've never observed it. And we, it's, it's virtually impossible to imagine any kind of technology that you would observe. These things would be so feebly interacting as to be hopeless to detect in any conceivable experiment for the next... I don't know, 100,000 years or whatever, something like that. But if you surveyed a whole bunch of experts on quantum gravity or something, almost all of them would tell you that the sink probably exists somewhere, somewhere deep down. And the real reason is because if space and time, as Einstein envisioned it, worked all the way down forever, quantum mechanics can't work. But it works really, really well. We measure it in any number of ways. We calculate things to 12 significant digits and measure them in the right number. So we know it works. So what that tells us is that some, at some point, at sufficiently high energy densities or temperatures or whatever, general relativity has to break and has to turn into something quantum. And that means maybe, maybe that means space and time comes in little discrete bunches. We don't know. But almost certainly the phenomena we call gravity comes in pieces, gravitons. That being said, could totally be wrong. But that is, that is the consensus view right now. But without any experiments, who am I to say, right? But, but that's a, that is a consensus view. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, you said a couple times, we don't know how to do this experiment yet, or um, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think um, the frontier is in terms of how we make the next big leap. Is it just ever bigger accelerators? And, and by the way, you should understand that congressman from Kansas hates economists. So that argument's not going to work. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, that, I didn't think of it through that way. But yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's a bunch of stuff going on right now that is advancing our knowledge of these kinds of questions. I'm, and I, I, could, I mean, I could list... 50 or 100 different endeavors. I can't do that here, but I'll mention a few. We're still making more and more powerful dark matter detectors. It would not surprise me if in the next 10 years we discover these particles. 
we are um, currently the Large Hadron Collider is shut down for an upgrade. So we're going to improve the detectors. We're going to learn more. And then I think in the next decade or so, we're going to shut it down and turn it on at a much higher luminosity run. By luminosity, I mean more collisions per second. And so right now we're doing 600 million per second. I forget what the final number is going to be, but it's much, much higher, maybe 10 times higher or something. And uh, that will allow us to look for more feebly interacting things that are currently eluding us at the Arch Hadron Collider. One of the programs I'm really excited about are the what we call the stage four of cosmic microwave background measurements. These are going to take place over the next 10 years or something. And they are going to hopefully tell us some more, more inform us more about the details of cosmic inflation. Um, if they succeed in all the ways that we hope they will, we will know things like what the energy density of space was like during inflation and maybe tell us something about the kinds of uh, what we call fields that were involved in inflation. But, you know, that's ho hopefully that will happen. We're not sure. Um, some other things I'm really excited about, I didn't talk at all today, but sometimes I do in these lectures about gravitational wave astronomy. So right now, and over the last few years, for the first time we've detected this phenomenon. Basically, when two black holes spiral into each other and merge, it's such a volatile and dramatic event that the space and time around that object start to ripple. And those waves travel through space, not through space, they are made of space and time. Okay? And they come to Earth, and we have these super, super sensitive detectors that when the distances between their two points in space begin to grow and shrink, and I don't mean stuff moving through space, I mean space itself, you can actually tell that's going on. Those ripples in space and time. These gravitational wave detectors are amazing. And uh, there are plans unfunded at this moment, but hopefully funded in the future, to deploy a, a constellation of satellites that will function as an incredible gravitational wave detector in orbit around the sun. And they could detect gravitational waves from inflation, from various phase transitions in the early universe. Like you can actually imagine peering deep well into that first fraction of a second that I'm talking about today with such a detector. So there's lots of stuff I'm excited about. Um, this is not a stagnant field by any you know, stretch of the imagination. It's a very exciting time to be a cosmologist. I'll at the risk of saying that again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.